Amen. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. We're going to read out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 today. Amen. I'm happy to be on the Lord's side. Yes, hallelujah. Today we're learning about a very important subject, a, a subject that I would say well over 90% of Americans, Christians, have wrong, and that is the topic of sanctification. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand what the Bible says about sanctification. Yes. And I can tell you right off the bat that you're either sanctified mm -hmm. or you're not sanctified. The Bible never explains sanctification as being sanctified. Right. It always explains it as you are either sanctified or not. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. Not, not only that, but we're going to be looking at sanctification as a whole and getting a better understanding of what it means and how we're sanctified. And we're going to actually look at the Old Testament when it comes to blood sacrifices even so that we can know exactly when we become sanctified in Christ. Amen. So this is good to know, isn't it? Amen. So we're going to read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to start at verse 3, but first I'm going to open in prayer. Father God, I ask that you would have your way with this sermon today, God. We need to understand sanctification from a biblical standpoint. Father, we know that your word has all the answers in it, but it's only by your spirit that you open our understanding. So help me to hit, uh, hit these points you want me to. Help me to be clear. Help me to speak your word. Manifest your spirit through your word, God. Your word is spirit and it is life. We give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You saints going to help me preach this today? Yes, amen. Okay, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. You may be seated. So it's the will of God, so if it's the will of God, you better know what you're talking about, right? Mm. Uh, Apostle Paul said, you better find out what the will of God is. You should be praying, what, God, what is your will? What is your will? And guess what God will do? He will reveal His will to you out of His Word. And He says, first of all, the first order of business in the Christian's life is sanctification. If you're not sanctified, you're not saved. So you need to be sanctified as a Christian. And we're going to be finding out what that means. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. This is the, I think this is the best biblical definition for sanctification. 2 Timothy chapter 2. So now we're defining sanctification. You Remember, you're either sanctified or you're not, right? You're either sanctified or you're not sanctified. There's no being sanctified in the Bible. But don't believe me. Let's go to the Word. Amen? Yes. Don't take my word for it. Let's go to the Word. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified. Everybody say sanctified. 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 Amen. And meet for the master's use. And prepared unto every good work. So first of all, we see from this verse that uh, a sanctified person is somebody who has purged himself from these. And if you know this, this uh, verse in the Bible, you know that he's talking about sins. He's listing off sins. And he's saying if somebody purges themselves of these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. And he shall be sanctified and meet for the master's use. Not everybody is meet for the master's use. Not everybody is is uh, qualified. Not everybody is is uh, do or what's a good word for meet? I would say meet means um, 
Qualified, it means uh, prepared, right? Meat for the master's use. Mm -hmm. And prepared unto every good work. So if you're not pure, if you're not purged of the, your sins, you won't be a vessel of honor, you won't be sanctified, you won't be a meat for the master's use, and you won't be prepared unto every good work. Remember, those who obey are the people that are going to understand the word. Mm -hmm. Remember, all, all the people that don't obey, they go off these other doctrines because they can't read the Bible for themselves because it doesn't make sense to them. Those who obey, the Bible is going to make sense to them because holiness is going to make sense and, and, and all the doctrines are going to make sense. Amen. So in this verse, there's a call, and not only in this verse, but in the whole word of God, there's a call to come out from among them and touch not the unclean thing. There is a call to sanctify ourselves. We have to sanctify ourselves. Define sanctified. So, so sanctified means to be set apart unto holiness for God's use. That's my definition. I got that just from knowing the Bible. It's to be set apart. Write this down. To be set apart unto holiness. To be set apart unto holiness for God's use. For God's use. To be set apart unto holiness for God's use. That's what it means to be sanctified. Also means to be consecrated. Sanctified means to be consecrated. Those who are sanctified are consecrated. It means to be free from sin. This was in the Merriam-Webster's. To be free from sin is one of the definitions. Sanctified. Somebody was saved in Merriam-Webster's dictionary. Amen. 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 It means to purify. And it means to make holy. So if you're sanctified, you're made holy. So we have to sanctify ourselves by setting ourselves apart, by purging ourselves, by doing what the Word of God says. But then there's a a uh, sanctification of the Spirit, where the Spirit purifies and sets you apart. John 17, verse 16. Turn there in your Bible. John 17. Jesus sanctified Himself. That's what we're going over uh, right now. John 17, 16. And this is all in light that we have to sanctify ourselves. If Christ sanctified Himself, we have to sanctify ourselves, don't we? Because we follow in his footsteps. So John chapter 17, verse 16, it says this. They are not of the world. So they're separate from the world. That's sanctification. They are not of the world. Even as I am not of the world. It shows the separation there. Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world, and for their sakes I sanctify myself. Do you see that? For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So Christ has set himself apart you know, I, I think of somebody who is set apart. You know, they're not going to sit at the bar because they're sanctified. They're set apart. They want. They don't want people to get the wrong idea of them because they are set apart from the world. So Jesus is saying, "I've set myself apart from the world, so that there's no." The Bible says he's separate from sinners, and that we should follow in his footsteps. So we're, if we're following Jesus, we are separate from sinners. We're not yoked up with sinners, and this is part of being separate from the world. They're not of the world. They sanctify themselves. And they, and they sanctify themselves through thy truth. If there's no truth, what, what divides us? What separates us from the sinner? Isn't it the truth? We have the truth. They're, they're burning. They're, they're going to burn in hell. They're uh, children of wrath, right? Children of... They're enemies of God. We have nothing. Absolutely. If, if you're sanctified... The Bible says you have nothing in common. What does light have in common with darkness? If you're truly sanctified, and that's how I know that a lot of people really aren't sanctified, that are supposed to be sanctified. They're not separate. That's why they get defiled. That's why the American church has been defiled. That's why this teaching is so important 
because I've seen my whole church growing up, grew up in the Pentecostal church, and they, were, they had the truth. The Spirit of God was in that place. But as we grew up, what happened? All the kids were, not, were, were mixed in with the worldly kids. They were mixed in with the worldly people. So all of them fell away. All, every single one of them, and I was the last one, I remember. I remember falling away. And this is why it's so important that, that we are separate from sinners. We're separate from the world. We're separate. We're not yoked in. When, when our kids were mixed in with the, and, and this isn't against all Baptists, but we went to a false Baptist church when we first got saved, and our kids would always get sick from their kids. Their kids were, were under the wrath of God because they were under the wrath of God. So their kids were cursed too. Do you know that you're cursed when your parents are cursed? Yeah. But if one of your parents are saved, the Bible says they're sanctified through the saved parent. Yeah. But in the Baptist yeah. church, they're all they don't have the they're not sanctified by the truth. They're not clean. So they have a curse on their life. They're always getting sick. Always getting colds. Always. I'm not saying if you get a cold, you're under a curse. But I am saying they're always sick. And our kids would always get sick from their kids in the, in the nursery. What am I trying to say is God had to show us they're not clean. And we actually, the last week we were there, God, we ran out of there like fire and brimstone was falling from heaven because God said, run, get out of this place. And I said, God says, leave now. And we left right in the beginning of the service. Yes. Because judgment fell on that place. And I don't know, because I don't keep tabs. I'm not on Facebook, praise God if you are. Use it for the kingdom. But I'm not on uh, Facebook. But I guarantee when God, when God tells a man of God to flee, it's not going to be good for the rest of them. And the people that did believe in holiness in that church, they went into the delusion. The people that, that were supposed to come out with us and I was warning them you come out of this church God is calling us out of this church and they didn't leave and, and I ended up talking to them a month or two later and they were saying the same exact thing they were saying mm. that nobody's perfect we're all in sin yeah. and one, uh, one guy said we're not even born again until we go to heaven we're not born of God until we go to heaven so this is important to be sanctified Part of being sanctified is being separate, yeah. set apart. So it, the Bible commands us to be separate. It says you will be defiled. Mm -hmm. You will 100% chance that if we don't separate, and that's why I, I love what the Amish do, even though I don't believe they have the truth, I love that their, their sense of community and their sense of separation it now, if they evangelize, I think they that would be healthy what they do, the way that they've separated from the world. Mm -hmm. When they get jobs, they don't get jobs from the world and mix in with them. They get jobs within their own community. Mm -hmm. And God protects them from a lot because of that. Yeah, it's just good common sense. The world's wicked. Yeah. Um, I've heard saints say, you know, the, the biggest mistake I made is letting my kids go work with sinners. Because they picked up their philosophy. No, I'm going to be training my kids to to uh, have their own business. Amen. Amen. I'm going to be telling them to cut the grass. Where they're going to have a, a they're going to be making money and they're going to be in a owner mentality, not in a yeah. get in the system mentality. Yeah. Amen. That's right. So that they can build a business, they can have businesses that they own and they can hire people and they can have people make them money. So this is all part of how we can strategize as parents, we can strategize as the people of God, how to keep our family, our kids, away from the wicked kids, away from the sinner kids, away from the wicked uh, adults that don't have our values. Because what? They're cussing in front of them. They're drinking in front of them. And the Bible says that will be held accountable as parents. Amen. So if we don't let those people know ahead of time that, hey, when I'm around you, you don't cuss in front of my kids. 
If you, when I'm around you, you don't smoke in front of my kids. You don't drink in front of my kids. You know, I think with my dad, I don't think I told him not to smoke because he's a smoker. But I think I did. I definitely said don't drink. And and uh, don't make sure not to cuss. And make sure. So you gotta, even though it's your parents, even yeah. you gotta make sure that your parenting plan is is in, and you are solid. You're right before God. God, I'm going around them, but I'm or we're safe. We're separate. We're still separate, and that's really the only way to to stay clean. Otherwise, you'll be damned with them. I'm telling you the truth. The Holy Ghost is all over me right now. Hallelujah. You'll be damned with them if you don't come out from from among them and be separate. Hallelujah. So, God wants us to really take this sanctification serious. And, and, and if, we, if we are around sinners, we have to let them know, hey, it's just like after I got saved. My best man, I was best friends. He was my best friend. He was my best friend since second grade. When I first started hanging out with him in second grade, I was a Christian. I was a serious Christian at second grade. And I used to tell him, if I hang around you, you can't cuss. You know, because that was my justification of hanging around him. Hey, if I hang around you, you can't cuss. Uh, so he would watch his mouth when he was around me. Well, I ended up being defiled, like the Bible says, because I was hanging out with him and hanging out with other sinners. Before you know it, in sixth grade, we're doing drugs. We're smoking. Fifth grade, smoking cigarettes. Sixth grade, smoking marijuana. You know, this is normal. This is normal in the world. So that's why it's stupid. It's so stupid for Christian parents to think that somehow their kids are going to be different. So my point is, my best man, my best man, when I got saved again, I got saved because I fell away. Uh, I got saved when I was um, about 30 years old. And I told him, I said, look, no more cussing. I'm not the same Jacob as I used to be. And uh, this is right when I got saved. And I would just talk about the Lord with them because I was crazy about the Lord. I found I found my I came back to my first love. And that pushed him away. But I was like, praise God, that's the only way I can be be with this guy is if I'm always talking about the Lord. And even when when I'm around unsaved family, it's always the Lord. I my life is the Lord. You can't separate me. If you, if I'm not talking about the Lord, I really have nothing to talk about. What are we talking about? Stupid stuff like work, mm. right? Stuff that is perishing. Who cares? Who cares about this carnal stuff? It's just small talk. Let's get to what's matter. People are burning in hell for eternity. That's what we need to talk about. You're going to the lake of fire, buddy. few more days left and God's going to get you. That's the only thing on my mind when I'm around a sinner. What does light have in common with darkness? Yeah. I know the truth. I'm in the light. My mind is always in eternity. Heaven or hell? What is this? Is this leading me to heaven or hell? Yeah. And, and, and part of sanctification, saints, and we're about to go over this, sanctification is more than just not sinning. Sanctification has to do with doing the will of God. There's a lot of people that stop sinning, but they're still idolaters because they're still living for their will. That's why I, I, I tell people, you have to give your whole life when you come to Christ. If He wants you to go to, if He, if he wants you to do anything, you have to do it. It's not just stopping sin. They just stop sin and then continue on with their own life, doing what they want to do. But that's not Christianity. Yeah. And that's what we're about to go over here. Christianity is, is living for the will of God. Not my will, but your will be done. That's when we're sanctified. And that's what we're going to prove in the Scriptures right here. Hebrews chapter 10. Let's turn there in your Bible. And you guys are familiar with this, but we're getting a deeper understanding of it. Of when we're sanctified. Now we're going to see like the, the legal... The, the legal uh, background things that are happening in sanctification through the blood of Christ. Hebrews 10, verse 6. 
Is everybody there? Amen. It says, In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above, and now he's explaining what he just talked about. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not. Neither had his pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second, right? He taketh away the first covenant, that he may establish the second covenant. So that's when. That's when. When, you, when you come and you say, I come to do thy will, that's when the first is removed and the second is established. And then he goes on to explain in verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified, so by this will, right? When you give up your will for his will, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. See, a lot of people are giving up their sin, but they're not giving up their will. Mm -hmm. They're still doing their plans, aren't they? This is when, so this is when, and then that, that, that was it at the end of 10. Uh, this is me now. This is when you are sanctified by the blood of Jesus. When we put our body on the altar as a living sacrifice to do His will. I'll say that again. This is when we're sanctified by the blood of Jesus. A lot of people can't get this. Okay? It's a straight and narrow path. Many will try to enter in and can't enter in. We're sanctified by the blood of Jesus when, our, when we put our body on the altar as a living sacrifice to do His will. That's when the blood is applied. Not just stopping what is evil. We start living for the will of God. In assuming we will keep ourselves on that altar for the rest of our lives, He says this, For by one offering He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. By one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. That's Hebrews 10, 14, a few verses after that. So that's assuming that you're still on the altar, right? Let's look at uh, Leviticus chapter 8 in your Bibles. We're going to look at an example of a sin offering to find out what, it's, what, it, uh, what Paul's trying to teach us through the sin offering. By, by keeping our bodies, we have to understand the process of offering. The process of offering. So Leviticus chapter 8, we're going to read two verses, 14 and 15. Say amen when you're there. Amen. And he brought the bowl lock for the sin offering. What's a bowl lock? Bowl, right? Mm -hmm. And Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the bowl lock for the sin offering. So that was like a representing it like your sins going on to the beast, right? Your sins going on to the to the bullock. And he slew it. And Moses took the blood and put it upon the horns of the altar round about with his finger and purified the altar. So first, the altar has to be purified. Okay? And when you put the blood... When you put the blood on the horns, uh, on the um, horns, what that represented is God. We're looking for mercy. Look on the blood, all right? And put it upon the horns of the altar, round about with his finger, and purified the altar, and poured the blood at the bottom of the altar. So I think that's what purified the altar is when he poured it on the on the uh, at the bottom of the altar, and he sanctified it. So he sanctified the altar, right? to make reconciliation upon it. I want to read verse 15 again. And he slew it, and Moses took the blood, and put it upon the horns of the altar, round about with his finger, and purified the altar, and poured the blood at the bottom of the altar, and sanctified it to make reconciliation upon it. So everything had to be purified by blood back in the Old Testament. The sin sacrifice was slain, and then the blood was applied to the horns of the altar. Now we sacrifice our bodies 
as living sacrifices, and then the blood of Jesus is applied. But unless we're on the altar, there's no blood applied. And unless we stay on the altar, there's no blood applied. We have to get on the altar and stay on the altar a whole life, and then we're perfected forever by the blood. Then, in other words, we're sanctified forever. But if we get off that altar and start doing our will and just being religious but doing our will, right? Because that's what it is when you just stop sitting but live for your will. You're just Now you're just religious. Am I telling the truth? Is this too hard for y'all? No, you're right. Am I? Praise God. Repentance. So when we, when we lay ourselves on that altar, everything dies. And we, ought, and we lay ourselves, why does he say a living sacrifice? Because now we're not, we're, we're alive in Christ. Now we're not dead in our sins anymore. Now we're a living sacrifice. And now we have to live for him. We're not dead. We're alive and we have to live the will of God. We have to live the will of God. And in that, we stay on the, we stay on the altar. And in that, we're perfected forever. In that, we're sanctified. And that blood separates us. This is the supernatural working of the Holy Spirit. When the blood's applied, the Spirit separates us. And not only separates us, but he, he cleanses us with that blood. He cleanses us and sets us apart. Now we're not of the world anymore. Now we're not like the sinners at all anymore. And this is the experience. This is an experience of being set apart by the Holy Ghost. He will thoroughly cleanse his threshing floor. So he will thoroughly, he will put the fear of God in you. He will thoroughly cleanse his threshing floor. So some people turn away from sin. I have been talking about this. Some people turn away from their sin, but their life is still not owned by God. That is not acceptable. God is not in all their thoughts. He is not in all their decisions. They are still Lord of their own life. Furthermore, repentance is more than just turning from sin, but it is offering your whole body, your whole life, your whole body to God to do as He wills and living a life with Him at all times. That's what it is. I want to read that again. That's good, ain't it? And be writing down anything that sticks out in this sermon. Furthermore, repentance is more than just turning from sin. That's part of it, right? We say repent of your sins. But it's not just repenting of sins. But it's offering your whole life. Because ain't that what we see today? There's a lot of people repent of their sins, but they don't offer their whole life. Yeah. Let's not fall into that trap of thinking that God just wants our sins. No, God wants our little pinky toe. Amen. God wants the little fat part on your ear. <laughs> God wants, He owns your, the rights to your whole life. You lose your rights when you become a Christian. You ever heard that before? You lose your rights when you become a Christian. And now it's not my will, but thy will be done. And Christ showed us the perfect example in the Garden of Gethsemane. When He was sweating blood because He was resisting sin. What sin was He resisting? Well, he didn't want to go to the cross. The sin to not go through with it. Say, you know what? You guys can die for yourself. I'm out of here. You guys don't deserve this. That's what we deserve. We deserve for him to be like, you know what? I lived, I lived it. You guys deserve it. Why am I getting it? So he could have, he could have hardened his heart and sent twelve legions of angels. The Bible says to destroy them. But what did He do? Because He loved us. He died for us. The unjust for the, the just for the unjust. That He might bring us near to God. By His blood. Amen. So we're sanctified by that blood. We're sanctified. We're cleansed. We're holy. You know sanctified means to be made holy. So... If you've just repented of your sins, but your whole life doesn't belong to God, you're in the Christian version of idolatry. 
That's what idolatry is. When, when, our, when our whole life is a surrender to God, that's idolatry. In, a, in other words, sadly, most Christians today think they're going to heaven because they've repented of their sins. I'm talking about in the street preaching world now. Because they've repented of their sins, but they're not being led by the Holy Spirit. They are still living for their will, not God's. So, these are the sons of God, those who are led by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God has to be leading us. What God's been teaching us through these last few weeks is that it's more than just repenting of sins. Being righteous is more than just repenting of sins. We know that righteousness is believing in God. And in that, we will, will not sin in that faith. That's why it always talks about being in the faith. If you're in the faith, you're going to be righteous. You are righteous. And if, and if I always say to people that say, well, righteousness has been imputed to me, well, if righteousness has been imputed to you, then you'll be living it. Amen. If that's Amen. your doctrine. Right. But you can't say that righteousness has been imputed to me and then live like a devil. Right. Amen. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Why did he say that? To shut down that lie. That somehow we've in, imputed righteousness, but through faith, but now, but we're still not righteous. No, right. that's a lie from the pit of hell. Right. If you've been sanctified, you've been set apart and cleansed and washed, and now you're separate from sinners. Right. See how important this teaching is. Yes. Let's turn to he, uh, Romans chapter twelve. We're going to talk more about this living sacrifice. It's important to. See yourself on the altar, your life on the altar. It's important to see yourself sanctified. That's how, that's how we know people that aren't holy that they haven't been sanctified, right? People that are smoking, you're not sanctified. You're still chewing tobacco, you're not sanctified. These are obvious things. These are like step one at becoming a Christian. But then after that, we have to follow Jesus. It's not just about, and I've made that point a lot, but we have to follow Jesus. We have to do the will of God, right? Let's look at Romans 12, 1 through 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. See that separation there? Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So Paul, he said, I beseech you. That means like, I beg you. Uh, if I can tell you anything, let me tell you this. I beseech you is a very strong thing. By the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. You know what? I thank God that He brought me. He brought me to this point in jail. This is the point He brought me to, and I had very little understanding of it. But I was the Holy Spirit that brought it to my mind, and I said, "God, if you'll save me, I'll give you my whole life." See, He was sick of religious Jacob. Amen. He was sick of the religious guy. He wanted everything. He wanted my whole life. And I said, if you save me, I'll give you my whole life. And that's what he was waiting on. Because before then, it was just, I'm, I'm going to be a, a good Christian. right? He don't want you to be a good Christian. He wants, you to, he wants to own everything in your life. He wants you to live completely for him. Now when I say a good Christian, I mean America's version of being a good Christian. Right. Well, he's doing his best, right? <laughs> it's a it's a process. Sanctification is a process. Yeah. Right. Show me that in the Bible. Right. In the Bible, it always talks about. Okay, and I forgot to make this point. Thank you, thank you, Holy Ghost. In, in Hebrews chapter ten, verse fourteen, in the King James, it says, "He has perfected forever all those that are sanctified." But in the New King James, which I like the New King James, but it's wrong in this in this part. 
So I looked it up. It says, um, Jesus has perfected, um, has perfected those who are being sanctified. The New King James says being sanctified, right. but the King James says that are sanctified. That's a big difference. Yeah. See, they're putting their understanding of sanctification into the Scriptures. They're taking their understanding and interpreting the Scriptures to say what they wanted to say. But I looked it up in the, in the Greek, and that meant sanctified. You're sanctified. Those who are sanctified. See, they don't understand atonement. They don't understand the sacrifice, what we just went over in Leviticus. They don't understand when the blood's applied, you are sanctified. You're sealed by the Holy Ghost. Amen. When that blood comes through, you're, you're saved. Amen. Because of that sin offering. Right. <sighs> Praise the Lord. Yes. So, <clears throat> a living sacrifice. I always think about when I when I think of that, I think about when I was uh, a sinner and I would I was coming to Christ, I was zealous as anybody could be zealous, and I was I said, Lord, I will die for you. Reminds me of Peter. <laughs> I will die for you, Lord. And he said, You won't even live for me. You won't die for me. The proof that we would die for him is living for him. That's the proof that we would die for him. If we would, if we would uh, rather die than sin, then we would die for him. Because I think that's what, for a lot of us in the tribulation, it's going to come down to that. They're going to somehow threaten your life and say, deny God, deny Christ as your Savior. And if you don't do it, they're going to shoot you in the head. But even if you do deny it, they'll probably still shoot you in the head. <laughs> then you're in hell. Then you're in hell and you can't get out. Who cares if you just lose your body? Yeah. Don't fear him who can only kill your body and do no more. But fear him who after the body's dead has the power to cast both body and soul in hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. This life is but a vapor. You're going to be dead soon. Quit hanging on to this life like you're going to live forever. Amen. Amen. Get the mind of Christ. That's right. Yes. So, a living sacrifice. You've got to live for him. You've got to be alive. Holy. Holy, holy, holy. That's the only reasonable sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. If it's not holy and if it's not your whole life, it's not, your re it's not reasonable. God rejects it. So be not conformed to this world. So don't be conformed to them. Be separate. Don't be eating that those movies when you I want you to think spiritually about everything when you watch a movie you're eating that you're like eating it like chips you know no I want you to eat healthy food I want you to eat the best spiritual food my kids they get grade A all the time that's why they're so big and healthy because I just put good stuff in them why would I put garbage in them when I can put the best in them spiritually and we're pretty strict physically too, but not near as strict physically as we are spiritually. They can go to heaven if they're a little fat. <laughs> but they ain't going to go to heaven if I put garbage into them. If I put secular, secular stuff into them, that's a waste. It's a waste. But what is the carnal mind? The carnal mind's enmity against God. The carnal mind says, oh, it don't matter. It's not that bad. Right? That's not, a, that's not the mind of Christ. He says, be vigilant, be diligent, because your adversary, the devil, runs around like a roaring lion. The devil's trying to kill you. And I've yeah. seen him kill, I've seen him wipe out everybody in my old past religious life uh -huh. that was really saved. So people that say, once saved, always saved, the devil is a liar. I've seen them. Yeah. I've seen people leave the light and go in the darkness because they wouldn't keep their life on the altar because it hurts. You have, you have to suffer. Those who suffer with Him will reign with Him. It's hard to stay on the altar. It's hard to carry your cross. You get hated by everybody. Your family rejects you when you're a real Christian. Hey, 
But if you don't, if you can't meet these standards to help me raise my kids right, then you can't be around my family. And you don't really love us. So shame on the families that stop hanging out with us because we have normal standards. Right. Normal Christian standards. Yeah. Don't be a wicked devil in front of the kids. Yeah. we got to protect these kids. Nobody protects the kids because everybody's living for themselves above the kids. Ain't that why they don't protect the kids? Yeah. Because they, their pleasure is more important than the kids' well-being. Mm. Because it's not God's will be done, it's my will be done. And I can just spice it up with a little religion and not sin. Right? But that's not the cross. No. And that's damaging, and that's selfish, and that's not good parenting. And what are our, what are our kids going to do? They're going to desire, if we're hanging out with sinners, and they're drinking in front of our kids, they're going to desire that just like how you desired it, and you were a wicked devil. Yeah, that's true. Because they had you around it. You got a taste for it. You were like, oh, what is... What is dad doing? What is grandpa doing? See? And then and then the religious people, they're like, oh, you're trying to hold something back from me. That's what they say to the, mm -hmm. to the godly people then because you put a taste in their mouth. Yeah. You put, it's like putting sugar in a kid's mouth. Now they're going to want it all the time. That's how it is. You put the world in their mouth. Now they're going to want it. Now they ain't going to listen to nothing you say because you put that taste in their mouth. So, my goal is so that I build my kids to where by the time they're old enough and by the time they get around that, they're going to be so used to living righteous and holy and, and abiding in Jesus that they're going to look at that and say, Ew! Amen. Just like I train them to see immodesty. I train them, when we see an immodest person, I'll say, look, they're immodest. They're naked. Why am I doing that? I'm training them to think like Jesus so that they don't dress like a whore Amen. when they're older. Amen. We have to train our kids to be righteous judges. Amen. And if you don't do that, you don't love them. Amen. Because they're, they're facing a bigger battle than we are, than we had to face. They're for sure going to be the... I mean... They're for sure going to be the last generation. I, I say that with all confidence. Mm. They're for, they're, this generation, our kids are going to be the generation that has to die for their faith. Mm. I believe that with everything in me. Can I prove it? No. But I believe it with everything in me, the way that everything's progressing so fast. Mm. How bad do you think it's going to get? I mean, they already want to kill us. Mm. They're already gnashing our teeth at us. So we got to prepare them for the battle as they were singing. We got to make sure their armor's on. We got to make sure we're teaching our wives. Because we are the ones in charge as men to disciple our women. God said, if you don't do it, they won't get it. So that's what our focus is. My wife, she knows the Word of God because I put it in her, I taught it to her, I made sure. You better know these people are going to hell that aren't, that aren't sanctified. You better know because that's the way to love her. That's the way to protect her. That's the way to wash her from this, the filthiness of this world. And through that word, she has been sanctified. She went to a wedding yesterday with her family. She did not fit in. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God she comes back crying. That means the word, I did my job. She ain't supposed to get along with them. They're enemies. The fool of the devil. So that's how you know you're doing your job is if they don't feel comfortable with sinners. Yeah. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. So, in the Old Testament, the sacrifice of the animal was, sanct was sanctified once the animal was offered on the altar and the blood was applied. Matthew 23, 19, Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctified the gift? 
The altar sanctifies the gift. Amen. The altar has been sanctified by the blood, but now the altar, the animals put on the altar to die. And that and that animal is sanctified through the blood, through the altar. Right. Amen. Uh, so that's why there was altars at the front of churches, so that you could come and lay down your life. So you could come and sacrifice yourself. That's what it means to have an altar so that you would come and offer your life to God as a sweet smelling aroma, as a sacrifice. Does that make sense? Amen. So in this case, Paul is teaching us our minimum requirement is to stay on the altar of sacrifice. If we stay on the altar, we are forgiven and washed from our sins. And as long as we stay on the altar, we are perfected forever. If we are not on the altar, that means God can do whatever. That means God can do whatever He wants with our life if we are on the altar. If we are on the altar, that means God can do whatever He wants with our life and we will do it. It means we are holy and separate to serve God at all times. A consecrated vessel that has been sealed by the Holy Spirit. Through this sanctification, we receive the promises of the new covenant. Through this sanctification, we receive the promises of the new covenant. And then uh, these next verses, just listen to them. They're verses about after we've the blood has been applied, now we're sanctified by the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation, through sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth. So God has chosen you for salvation through sanctification. That's how you're chosen for salvation. If you're not sanctified, you're not saved. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm saved, but I just cuss a little. No, you're not. You're not sanctified. Because when God sanctifies you, He sanctifies your whole life, including your heart and your wicked tongue. 1 Peter 1 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. So, guess, guess why they would sprinkle the blood? Because that sanctified everything. The blood. So, it, it was a symbol when he would take that brush, and, and you see the Catholic priest do it with water. But in the Old Testament, this. In the real church, uh, which wasn't a church back then, I guess, but it was in the congregation. In the congregation, they would throw blood on everybody. Yeah. As symbolism, that is the blood that cleanses you. Amen. It's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us. And uh, there's a great teaching on that. The uh, the precious blood of Jesus that was like six weeks ago. Amen. Check that out if you want to learn about that uh, cleansing flow of Jesus' blood. So 1 Corinthians 6.11 says, And such were some of you, but you were washed, but ye are sanctified. Ye are sanctified. Amen. Not you're being sanctified. Right. All the scripture agrees that it's not being sanctified, but it's you are sanctified. If you're saved, you're sanctified. You're holy. See, that's where I, I say that only a few are going to get this. I'm not looking to be popular. I'm looking to tell people the truth. Who wants to know the truth? Amen. People are afraid to teach this because they'll be rejected. Oh, well, I'm going with Jesus. Amen. Who cares? We're not, we've never been accepted, uh, as far as I know, Amen. except by other people born-again believers that are searching for the truth. That's who's going to want this truth. And if the Word says it, it's true. Amen. But ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So, you're sanctified. You are sanctified. Jude 1, 1 through 2, it says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. 
So, again, sanctified by God. Amen? We're set apart by God. We're cleansed by God. We're holy because of God. All right. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Amen. See, this, these lies of being sanctified has, have been going around for a long time. So he just had to make sure here what sanctification is all about. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. That means completely. And I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who is able to do it, who will also do it. So God, God does this. God does this. God sanctifies you. God keeps you so that it preserves you blameless. There's a war going on in our mind, isn't there? Every day there's a war going on in our mind, and God's trying to, or uh, the devil is trying to bring us out of that ark of safety. And he's got to convince us that we're unclean. He's got to convince us that we somehow sinned in our mind, right? He has to convince us that we somehow are, are dirty so that we will stop trusting in the blood. Yeah. Stop trusting in what God did in, in the sanctification. But He sealed you. He sealed you. As long as you're on that altar, you're, you're perfected forever. As long as you're on that altar. That's right. So, we have to be able to take control of our thought life yes. and cast down these wicked imaginations. Amen. Take control of your thoughts. Don't let your mind just run. Right. When you wake up in the morning, and uh, the enemy's tried to do this with me, when I wake up in the morning, your yeah. mind just tries to start running. Mm -hmm. Don't let it. You can stop it and pray against it. Father, help me to st yeah. stop this mind. I, I do not want my mind to run. That's anxiety. Yeah. There's yeah. Have you having your mind run, run? What, what if? What if? What if? Yeah. What? Right. That's uh, that's what the devil wants, so that you're not in the mind of Christ. Am I telling the truth? Amen. Right. So after you've sanctified yourself to the Lord, He will sanctify you wholly. Hallelujah. David said, per perfect all things concerning me. The Lord. You are asking God to completely separate you in holiness so He can use you for whatever and whenever He wants. I'll say that again. You are asking, when you say God perfect all things concerning me, you are asking God to completely separate you in holiness so He can use you for whatever and whenever he wants. So if you're a sanctified vessel, he can reach out and use you at any time, can he? Yeah. Got my, my faithful servant Samuel here. I'm going to use him, put him, put him out there on the street in this city. My servant John, I'm going to send him out to the, to the Baptist Convention because he's sanctified. It's made for the master's use. See, the Holy Ghost has separated us as a church, and that's why the Holy Ghost don't want every everybody in this church. Because he has a plan for us, and his number one plan is that we would be sanctified, that we would stay clean, because he's washed us. And you know how you stay clean? By continually washing yourself and the people around you in the Word. Amen. Amen. That's how you stay strong, way above temptation way above sin is you use your time wisely what would Jesus do yeah. he would be in the word all the time that's what Jesus would be doing well I don't love the word like that well pray for it and do it anyways and, it, and that love will be birthed in you the Bible says we're born again through the word of God if you don't love it then you're probably not born again we love the word don't we Hebrews 13. Turn there in your Bibles. Hebrews 13. Amen. Hallelujah. 
Hebrews 13, 7 through 14. Hebrews 13, 7 through 14. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which service the tabernacle. Hmm. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp, outside the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach, for we have no continuing city but we seek one to come. That's why we're willing to suffer because we have a continuing city to come. We're not living for this, this city, for this world. Amen. We're living for the city to come. That's why we're, we're willing to do that. Yes. Amen. Verse 10, it says, We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the ta tabernacle. He's talking about the, the priests that haven't been born again. They're doing the religious stuff, but they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. They have no, no right to eat the, the spiritual manna, the manna from heaven. Yeah. Say, say again? Bread of life. The bread of life, yeah. It's the manna, the bread of life. They have no right to eat it. Because they're even though they're the priests of the first covenant. Isn't that cool? Amen. Uh, wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood. See? We're sanctified with his blood. Suffered outside the gate. Let us go, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing, bearing his reproach. You're supposed to be able to bear his reproach because this ain't our home. Amen. Because we don't care about what people think of us. Because this isn't our people, this isn't our home. You know what Jesus said? He said, "Hey, uh, uh, I think it was a girl said, hey Jesus, your your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside waiting for you." Yeah. How? I mean, think of Jesus sitting there. Who's my brother, my sister, my mother? My who are these people? But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. That's who. That's who I'm related to. They could have probably really got hurt by that, right? But that's how radical Jesus is. Amen. He's radical for the people of God. Not to say his mother wasn't the people of God, but he was making a point. Amen. Yeah. My natural family is not my family. If they're not born again, they're not my family. Amen. That's what he said. Not to say we shouldn't take care of our family. We should take care of our family. The Bible says those who don't take care of their family, they're worse than an infidel. Amen. Which means I'm a believer. So yes, we take care of our family, number one, spiritually yeah. and physically. But if we just take care of them physically, what, what would it profit you if you gain the whole world and then lose your soul? Yeah. So we can't just take care of them physically. That's what the heathen do. Yeah. Right? The heathen, they, they take pride in their work. The work of their own hands. They worship the work of their own hands, the Bible says. But a wise man prepares his children and his wife for the battle ahead. And through that truth, they are sanctified. They are separate. They don't, they don't belong. They're strangers and pilgrims in this world. They have no continuing city. Is that good? Yes. Ephesians 2, uh, Ephesians 5. Uh, 22 through 27, you don't need to turn there. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. All right? That's, that's why we got to give our, our wives something to follow. Because the Bible says, submit and follow your own husband. 
Is that what it says? What it says. As unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. So if you're not submitting to your husband, I don't care if he's not saved. If you're not submitting to your husband, you are not a child of God. Because the Bible says, those who are, are saved, they will submit to their husband as to the Lord. So as if he was the Lord. So wives, if, are you submitting to your husbands as if he's Jesus? That's a, that's a tall order. And then, and then we go to the husband. 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, see, we're subject unto Christ. The church is subject unto Christ. Not just stop sinning. It's the whole will of God we're subject to that. So let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify. That he might sanctify. You see that? Amen. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. Amen. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. On Judgment Day, will you be able to present your wife as a glorious church? If not, you failed. Yeah. You can be the best street preacher in the world if your wife, I'm talking about wives that are submitting now, mm -hmm. right? Can't do nothing with a with a uh, donkey mm -hmm. if it ain't going to go. Mm -hmm. But the women that are submitting to the Lord, the women that are saved, the women that are following Jesus, they're going to submit to their husbands. And the Bible says that they're going to be a, a glorious church. So that's my goal is to present my, not only my wife, but she's going to present my kids. Wow. Which I'm overseeing that because I'm the head. But she's raising these kids to present them as a glorious church. Wow. And because she loves them, she's preparing them for the battle ahead. Wow. So this is what it means to sanctify your wife with the washing of the water of the Word, this has to be our focus in life. It can't be anything else. It can't be the pleasures of this world. Now, can we have can we have things? Yes, but everything in its order. Amen. Our focus as Christians is to make sure that we are preparing for judgment so that we can present our wives as a glorious church. And wives have to read their own Bibles, don't they? Just like us. We've got to read our own Bibles. Yeah. Our wives and children have got to read their own Bibles. You can't survive just off the sermon from Sunday. Right. Yeah, that's good food. The Holy Ghost is feeding you, strengthening you, renewing your mind. But if that's all you get, you're going to starve by next sun Sunday. You're going to be starved out. You're going to eat something bad because you didn't, weren't eating the good stuff. So, so remember, have you laid down your life for your wife? You know, because that's, mm -hmm. well, we always talk about the wife submitting, but right. do we have, do they have something to submit to? Or have we right. truly laid down our whole life? Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself. Mm -hmm. Have you gave your life? To your family? Have you gave your wife to your to your wife, to your children? We'll be judged on it. Yeah. Amen. Amen. It's the most important thing in life is that we're sanctified and that we're sanctifying our wives and our children with the word. And part of that sanctification, as we said, is, is physically separating too, not just spiritually, right? But physically separating. Am I telling the truth? All Christians are sanctified. Hebrews 2.11 For he that sanctifieth and, and they who are sanctified are all one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brother. And that was Hebrews 2.11. Acts 20. So, so the point of that was 
He sanctified. He that sanctifieth and those who are sanctified are all one. We're one with God because we've been sanctified. Amen. If you're not sanctified, you're, the Bible says those who are joined to the Lord are one spirit with Him. You're not one spirit with Him if you're not clean, if you're not sanctified, if you're not holy. Amen. Acts 20, verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among them which are sanctified. Amen. You got inheritance with them that are sanctified if you let him build you up and continue in the word of his grace. Isaiah 8:13. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear and let him be your dread. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself. So what that means to sanctify the Lord it means to sanctify him in your heart. He's set apart in your life, in your heart, like nobody else. So you're not fearing death anymore. He's your dread. He's the one that's going to judge you. He's the one that's going to throw you in the lake of fire if you don't do it right. That's the truth. If you don't stay on that altar, you will die and go to hell. So the dangers of not being sanctified. And sanctified, remember, whenever you hear sanctified, think of separate and made holy. Separate and made holy. Sanctified. Separate and made holy. Every time you hear sanctified, separate and made holy. Psalms 106, starting in verse 35, it says, 35 through 40, it says, But we're mingled among... Among the heathen, we're going to talk about the dangers of not being sanctified, all right? Because that's how everybody always falls, is they're not sanctified, they're not separate. Psalms 106, verse 35, for those who want to go there, you're welcome to. Psalms 106, 35 through 40. Psalms 106, 35 through 40. It says, But we're mingled among the heathen. See, they were mingled among the heathen. And learned their works. They learned their works. And they served their idols. Which were a snare unto them. I, I think of the wisest man to ever live. If the wisest man that could ever live, if this happened to him, you don't think it won't happen to us? That's why he said it's 100% chance it'll happen if we mingle ourselves among the heathen. Solomon was his name. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils. Isn't that what, what people are doing when they put them in front of TVs? Amen. They're sacrificing them to devils. They're devil bait. They're devil food. And shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. So they were actually physically, just like they're doing with the abortions today, right? They're sacrificing their kids to demons. When you kill your baby, you're sacrificing that baby to the devil. Verse 39. Thus were they defiled with their own works. See? It's your sin that defiles you, don't it? It's your own works. And went a whoring with their own inventions. Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against His people, insomuch that He abhorred His own inheritance. Oh. Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against His people, insomuch that He abhorred His inheritance. He abhorred the people. He hated His own people. I hate them. That's what God said. I abhor them. Abhor them is like, uh, like the most serious hatred you can have. It's like, oh, I'm disgusted. I hate their guts. <laughs> and that's what happens when people don't separate. God ends up hating you. This is what we need to hear, isn't it? Leviticus 20, 
23, 24, 26, Leviticus 20, it says, And ye shall not walk in the manners of the nation which I cast out before you, for they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. See that? They were doing all these things, and I abhorred them. So he's saying, don't walk in the manners of the, of the nation, which I cast out before you. For they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. But I have said unto you, ye shall inherit their land. See all these sinners that are selling their birthright for a bowl of soup? We're going to inherit their land. The same way that was happening back then. Ye shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess it. A land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. I have separated you from other people. Haven't I? Yes. And ye shall be holy unto me. Holy means, part of holy's definition is to be separate, isn't it? And ye shall be holy unto me. For I, the Lord, am holy and have suffered you from other people that ye shall be mine. When you think of severed, what do you think of? I think of umbilical cord. Yeah. Severed. I've cut the cord. You're not their baby anymore. You're not their people anymore. I've severed you from among them that you should be mine. What did, Abra what, what, what did God do with Abraham? Abraham, what did he do? He had to leave his father's house, didn't he? He had to leave his father's house. He's the father of faith that we follow. Why? Because we have a new, a, a new kingdom, a new family, a new existence. Revelation 18, 4 through 5. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye may not be partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. That's the day and age we're living in. Their sins are reaching, they have reached unto heaven. If you haven't noticed, judgment is already in the land. Judgment is these wicked parades. That's judgment. God's turned them over. They're having sin parades. You don't see thieves having thief parades. <laughs> you don't see uh, you don't see any other sin really, other than drunkards. They have big parties, but but other than that, they don't have. I don't. They don't really have parades that are called drunkard parade. I don't know nowadays. I, none would surprise me, but <laughs> but. These are the last days. Amen. These are the last days. He said, he's talking about the whore of Babylon. He's saying, come out of her. Yeah. Come out of her. These sinners, it's the, they're in the whore of Babylon. They're in the, they're in the system. They're in the wicked system of the world. The system of the dragon with the seven heads. That's a uh, satanic system that's invisible in the, in the world. It's a kingdom. The prince of the power of the air. So I believe this kingdom is is it, it's in the heavenly realm. It's in the it's in the heavenly right above us. There's a kingdom of darkness. And right above that is a kingdom of God. It's an invisible realm, the heavenlies. It's called the heavenlies in the Bible. It's a spiritual realm. And the last verse is 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. It says, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel. Right? That's what that's what I've been saying, right? What what do we have in common? If we're really the real deal, Paul says nothing. 
And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them. And walk in them. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be separate. Save the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. This is the way of salvation. This is the way of sanctification. This is the last verse for the day. The Bible talks, it's all about the whole point of God creating man was so that he could pull out a people for himself. All these sinners out here, God wanted it to be them too, but they passed it up. But the whole point of us survive, the whole point of of us uh, being alive in the world is so that who's going to serve me and who's not. And God picks out a people to be His, the people that say yes. He chooses them, right? They say yes. He sets them apart to be His people. If they remain apart, they're going to... And that's what sanctification means. If they remain apart and stay steadfast... They're going to inherit eternal life. If not, all eternity they're going to regret not staying apart. Yeah. So, I've never seen, guys, and this is sad, but this is the day that we live in, I've never seen people actually be successful in raising kids as Christians. And have, other, other than, uh, I know some people on, on TV <laughs> you know, that did it. But they were separate. I know that. that. That's what the Lord showed me. So that's because I because they separated themselves. They weren't mixed in. They didn't mingle in and get defiled. So I had never met anybody to be successful. That's why I'm so determined to do it. Because my kids are too precious. I told my wife, look, we're going to have a lot of kids so that if nobody else wants to... Uh, be around us, that they still have each other for company. You know, if nobody else wants to be separate and holy, they'll have them. They'll have each other, and that's the day and age we live in. This is a cross. I've, I've, my relation. I've given up relationships for these children, and God really. When I was coming up with this, God really, the Spirit of God was really having me hone in on separateness. I've given up a lot for these kids because that's that's my job as a father is to do what my father wouldn't do. Love me. Love me. Show it by giving up whatever it takes. That's what God did. He gave up Jesus, His Son. And what? We can't give up what some fake re they're fake relationships anyways. There's no fellowship outside of Christ. The Bible says that when we come into the blessing, that we will be the head and not the tail. And what that means is we're the ones in charge. We're the ones as Christians calling the shots because we have the security in Christ. We have the blessing. We're going somewhere. We have a future. So we don't care about this temporary stuff. We're willing to put it all on the line for Christ. And in that, we become the head. And the people of God become the head and not the tail. What's the tail doing? The tail's following. Just doing whatever everybody else wants to do. But the head is the leader. So, I know that I know what God has shown me because I have prayed and, and sought God. God, how am I going to get my family through this? How am I going to see my kids through the most wicked time on the earth and have them sanctified and holy? And I believe He's given us, He has given us that answer. But, but we have to carry the cross, don't we? So be sanctified. Stay on the altar. Carry your cross. Prepare your people for battle. Prepare them to be separate. Wash them in the water of the Word so that they're not like the other people. They're washed. They're clean. The people of God are clean. They're washed. They're separate. The people are dirty that are in the world. Yeah. 
So they're not supposed to be able to, if they're doing this, this is bad. If we're, if we're yoked up with sinners, that's bad. At all costs, we have to, we have to be separate. At all costs. So let's stand and pray and ask God for His help in this and that He would fully sanctify us and keep us and, and help us through every decision and every trial. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, this is a, a message that makes me tremble, Lord, because You have shown Yourself that You're true to this Word. That those who don't sanctify themselves, Lord, that, that they are defiled and destroyed. So I pray that you would just help each and every one of us as parents, as men, as women, as children, as teenagers, Lord. Every one of us would be separate and holy unto you. Fully sanctified. Blameless on the day of judgment. Help us to be bold, Lord. Help us to be ready for the battle. Help us not to have anything in our, putting anything in our in our spirit that's not of you. God, we need your grace. We need your hand to help us, Lord. Help us to catch on fire even more. Help us to be filled with your word each day. God, we don't want to fail, God. We don't want to come short. Please, Father, help us, help us, Lord, to, to see correctly. Help us to Walk in this light as Christ is in the light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.